Hey, it's Beth here. I got a good one. This is episode 180, January 4th, 2021. I'm talking about George Clooney and what a great practical jokester he was. I was talking to my son, Matt. He said, it takes patience. You got to be patient to be the best. This is what George did. Okay. So he's not a star. Nothing big's happening in his life. And he's, he's couch surfing for months and months and months on Richard Kind's couch. They're really good friends. You've seen the guy. He's a man. She was on Carol Burnett at the time. He's just a nervous Nelly sort of guy. Well, Richard goes and gets himself a little kitten, gets himself a little kitty litter box. The kitten is like four inches long. It's six weeks old. He's so in love with this kitten, rushes home every day to take care of his kitty. George is just on the couch watching Jeopardy. So George gets this crazy idea when the kitten is seven weeks old. Every day, George goes in the bathroom and he picks up the kitty turd out of the kitty litter. It takes Richard Kind three days to get worried. He comes out and he goes, you know, I'm kind of worried about my kitten. It's it's not uh, doing its business and I think it's really dangerous. George just listens to him, straight faced. So three more days go by. Richard Kind races into the house, checks the kitty litter before he does anything, comes out and he goes, I'm taking the kitty to the vet. I don't know what's going on. I got to fix this. Calls up, goes to the emergency room animal hospital in the middle of the night. The vet's palpating the kitten, has no idea what's going on. Gives him a different kitty food, right? To make it more like fiberish. Richard starts feeding the kitty. Comes home the first day after Carol Burnett. There's George on the couch watching Jeopardy. Rushes into the bathroom. Oh my God, it's not happening. It's not happening. Calls up the vet. Gets like a half an hour of emotional help. And the next day, same thing. Richard's losing his mind. He's trying to find a specialist in Los Angeles that deals with kitties with this problem. The third day, so this has been like a week and a half, George goes into the bathroom and he has a huge dump in the kitty litter. I mean, it, and he just goes back on the couch and starts watching Jeopardy. Richard Kine comes home, goes into the bathroom, screams, <laughs> come in here, look at this, what? Oh, where's my kitty, where's my kitty? The kitty is smaller than this thing. Just, oh my God, oh my God, oh, my kitty's fine, my kitty's saved, my kitty's saved. Richard's, I mean, Richard every day comes home to make sure everything's great with the kitty. George never messes with the kitty litter again. Richard Kind tells this story to everyone. Three years later, George has kept his mouth shut about this, and he's on David Letterman. And David says, so, you know, I hear you're kind of a funny guy. Spills the beans on this story. He's just getting famous. He's just on that um, doctor show. All the girls love him. And he tells this story. This is how Richard Kind finds out about it on David Letterman. The whole story, even what he did in the litter box himself, the whole thing. His manager comes up to him at the end of the show, pushes him up against the wall and says, I'm trying to make you a sex symbol. All anybody's ever going to remember is that you dumped in a kitty litter. Well, that didn't turn out to be so bad for him. But he did one other with um, Matt Damon and Variety and all those magazines before the Oscars and before the People magazine um, sexiest man in the world. They always have these for your consideration things that you pay for. For five years, George Clooney put that horrible picture of Matt Damon in that little green Speedo from Talented Mr. Ripley. And he, he said, sexiest man alive, sexiest man alive. It took five years and he was the sexiest man alive. So that's what he did. And he is wonderful. And I've got some others, though. So he's not the only one. Ben Franklin was pretty good at practical jokes, too. He was the original catfish. He loved writing letters to newspapers under different pseudonyms. One of his favorites was a saucy middle-aged widow that he channeled. 
and her name was Silence Do Good. And she was so wonderful. Plus, her name was Silence Do Good. So a lot of guys proposed to her. People would line up to read what she, her little editorials in the paper. He did it for years. So that's a good one. <clears throat> During World War II, the British had a good one. The entire country or their top guys. <clears throat> a British spy smuggled a really strong itching powder into the upper, upper levels of the Third Reich. And he, he, ha- he applied it to all of their underclothes in their drawers. And he somehow got it into all the condoms. I think that's wonderful. So that's a good one. There was this artist, Waldo Pierce. He was a very famous, very wealthy man in the 1920s. He had a little crush on a hotel concierge. He always stayed in this hotel in, in Paris, and he had to go back and back because he was famous, more famous there than here. So he gave this concierge a turtle. And every time he came back to visit with her, he would change the turtle out for a smaller turtle, bigger turtle, to the point where she was losing her mind because she'd look at her turtle one day and the turtle would be three inches long, then it would be six inches long, then it would be three inches long. And finally at a bar one night, there she was. And she's telling, she's telling this guy, Waldo, his name is Waldo, so you can't imagine how upset he was about life. The whole story, she started crying. I'm not feeding the turtle, your baby turtle properly. I'm doing something wrong. Waldo told her the whole story. To her credit, she laughed. And to his credit, he knew that was the girl that he had to marry. Because she laughed. Meant she could take anything. Take anything on the chin. Be cool about it. So that's kind of a love story in a very odd way. I don't understand it. So anyway, this one is good. This one is easy. First ever football game at Auburn. They were hosting Georgia Tech. And to make sure they felt really welcome for this very first game, some of the Auburn students went to the train station and greased the tracks so that the train couldn't stop at the depot It went five miles down the road and everybody, all the teammates and all their coaches and all their equipment, they had to walk it back five miles to the town and Auburn won 45 to zero. So that's a good story. Ernest Hemingway, of course, there's going to be one from him. He had a great drink, drinking buddy to, to his credit. Ernest had a lot of drinking, drinking buddies, but no one like this guy named Hockner. And he would say it like Hockner, like he was hawking. So they drank beautifully together. They had wonderful times together. And this guy could keep up with them. Well, one night, Ernest and he got so drunk that Ernest Hemingway convinced him that he had all the natural attributes of a great matador. They were in Spain, of course. Hockner believed it. And so the next morning, Ernest goes out and gets him an incredibly expensive matador outfit. Hockner puts it on because they're still drinking. He's got him drinking all day. He gets them all dressed up. The biggest match of the year was that afternoon. They were going to it. They had box seats, of course. And Ernest Hemingway convinced the powers that be to let Hockner be one of the matadors. That he's been trained. He's so amazing. Just let him in the ring and you will see. And Ernest, silver-tongued Ernest, got his way. And there he was in the ring, Hockner, drunk out of his mind, wearing the most beautiful outfit. And the stands were going, American, American, screaming, throwing flowers at him, everything. He's picking up the flowers. He's having a ball until the bull shows up. The bull shows up. He looks at the bull and he can't move. And it takes three clowns to pick him up and throw him off the ring. And they went out that night and they couldn't buy a drink. Everyone in Madrid fell in love with Hockner and his American matador skills. It became the biggest joke, the best thing that ever happened. I don't, I don't think Hockner ever paid for another drink as long as he lived. So that was a good one. And let me say there's more. There's much more. Okay. In 1818, the American naturalist James Audubon the James Audubon, the guy with all the pictures. He was 
having an insufferable time dealing with a snotty European naturalist who was knocking all of his work. So what he did was, he said, I'm going to show you my private collection of things that I have not shown anyone else. And he, he said, come back in three days because I need to get them out of the safe, which is down at the bank. And it takes a while for me to transport them home because no one can see them. So I have to do it one at a time, but I will have them all here for you. The naturalist is like, oh, well, of course you chose me and I will be here. What time? So it's three o'clock. Three o'clock, three days from that moment, Audubon, James Audubon had painted 28 pictures and they were all species that, all these species that he made up. The best one being a fish with bulletproof scales. The guy bought it all, left the house because it was James Audubon and started telling all of his colleagues what, what, because James said, don't you dare tell anyone any of this. It's our little secret. So this, this snotty guy goes out into the world and he tells people individually the secrets of James Audubon. And he becomes a laughingstock, which was, I guess, sadistic in a way. Okay, but I don't know. I wasn't there. So Leonardo da Vinci, I, I'm surprised he had any time to think of practical jokes, but he did. And his favorite one is, he, I don't even know how he did this. He dressed a lizard up to look like a dragon and he kept it in a box. And when special people come, came over, he would open, he would let them open the box. There'd be this, he said, I have a baby species that I'm keeping from the world because the world can't handle it and I don't know what to do. And I'm asking for your help. So he'd be like, of course I'll help you, Leonardo da Vinci. So he'd go and he'd say, just open that box over there. And he dressed this lizard up like a dragon. And people would scream and yell and go crazy. And he'd be laughing. And that's how he figured out who his friends would be. Because if you didn't think it was funny, it's the last time he saw you. If you did think it was funny, then he became friends with you. I mean, it's a little bit sadistic or I don't know what it is. Maybe he just, I don't know. He was Leonardo da Vinci. He could do what he wanted. But here's one. Here's my favorite, my absolute favorite. And it's Abraham Lincoln. This is so good. Okay. So Abraham Lincoln was with, with a bunch of lawyers and congressmen, and they were all going to Washington to fight something bold and wonderful and to change some laws and he's, they're all on their horses and their carriages. And it's, it's a, like a huge posse of them. Like 15 blowhards is what he said. And he had to listen to them talk about how they were, they were riding their, listen to this, listen to this. I'm going to, my, I'm going to orate. I'm going to tell the people what is happening. And it got more and more horrible as it went on. He couldn't stand it. I'm going to be famous. Not because I want to be, but because I'm the only one, that sort of thing. So what he did was, they, he said, look, guys, uh, I know a shortcut, and it will get us there three hours sooner than we'll get there if we keep going in this direction. They're like, yes, yes, we need to get there. I need to make my speech. No, I need to get mine. No, I need to get mine. Everyone needs to know me. He's like, okay, I know I need to get you all there quickly because America cannot live without you. So let's go this way. And there's a little uh, river we have, to, we have to cross over. So the guys are like, fine, fine, fine. So they get to the river and Abraham says, look. And they're like, listen to my speech. And never lets up, not for one second. Abraham Lincoln is going crazy with all of this, like, hubris or everyone is just spouting. So he comes up with this decision as they're getting ready to go into the water, he says, look, I, I need to tell you that the water gets pretty deep. So we all need to take all of our clothes off because we have to look good when we get to Washington. All your clothes off. And we'll just put them on when we get to the other side. Keep your gunpowder and your underwear dry. So the men were like, yes, yes, that uh, makes sense. That makes sense. So every single one of them took all of their clothes off. And they're going across the river, holding on to their horses. And the depth of this river 
was three and a half inches. When they got to the other side, they looked so stupid. Abraham Lincoln was laughing so hard that the rest of the trip was delightful. People were laughing at themselves. They needed to do it. They needed to calm down. And Abraham Lincoln calmed everybody down. They started having a ball, calling each other names, just having a good old time. And by the time they got to Washington, the speeches were more natural. Everyone got what they wanted. And they toasted Abe Lincoln probably with tea because he wasn't a big drinker that night. So sometimes practical jokes are the very best thing you could do. Leave it to Abraham Lincoln to prove that point. So I love it. I love it. I think there are more. I love that this is what people can do. I need to know things like this. I need to have fun. I need to remember life is supposed to be fun. And thank you, George Clooney. Thank you. I mean, Leonardo da Vinci. I just want to, I'm going to see if I can find that, a picture of the lizard that he dressed up like a dragon. It's just the coolest to imagine him with his big hands just doing that on a lizard. What's the lizard thinking? I have no idea. Maybe maybe gets good food, gets paid well. I don't know. I just, and Abraham Lincoln, of course, the best. So just want to give you a little laugh because it's Monday and it's January, very long month of January, but we're going to make it through. We're going to stay sane. I'm going to look for lovely, wonderful things that people do to enjoy life, get rid of the monotony. I mean, especially Abraham Lincoln, that long caravan with those blowhards. He knocked the stuffing out of that one. And Richard Kind, to find out three years later that his kitty, I mean, every day, this is what George said, every day after that, he was waiting for the next, next one, the next one to blow, the next bomb to go off with the cat. He told everybody about this cat and what happened. And he just riveted for three years, waiting, waiting for the next big bomb to go off. And when he found out, he was watching Letterman, when he found out what happened, to Richard Kind's credit, he laughed his head off. That's what we got to do. We just got to laugh. So anyway, stay sane. I'm going to stay sane. You're going to stay sane. And we're going to get through January. I will talk to you later. Bye-bye.